All right, so Mike asked me to just do like a, a case presentation about one of my patients um, using the movement system impairment um, kind of framework and system that WashU has been, been teaching me. So today we're gonna discuss, uh, I can kind of present about a patient that came in with hip pain. Um, I'm gonna talk through the initial evaluation and then the treatment and outcomes for her. So just for those who maybe aren't as familiar with um, the movement system impairment kind of framework and classification, um, kind of a, one of the key concepts is that the site of pain is most often related to the segment that moves too much in a particular direction or too early um, or through a, greater, through a greater range. So this is just a list of the different um, hip diagnoses within the MSI kind of framework. So my patient, uh, initial evaluation. So she came in with a referring diagnosis of left hip pain. It had been going on for about a year. She said she fell while she was carrying luggage up the stairs. And the x-rays were negative for um, any fracture. Again, it's what's going on for a whole year. Her pain levels kind of range between two to six out of 10. Aggravating factors was sitting or side lying. Uh, easing factors was supine. She didn't have any um, remarkable comorbidities or past medical history, um, just a little bit of history of low back pain. Her like occupation, hobbies, sports, et cetera, she said she was not currently working. She stays at home, kind of like a home taker. And then um, she has a history of pretty high level competitive water polo and swimming over the past, like, well, for like a period of like about 10 years, um, competing pretty intensely in that area. Her LEFS score was 38.75%. Her goals was to decrease her pain with her daily activities, get back to um, biking, boating, and just kind of doing all her housework without any problems. So moving on to more of the objective portion of the evaluation, I just kind of highlighted some of the key movement tests that kind of support um, the, the diagnosis that I gave her and why. Standing alignment, uh, it was honestly kind of difficult to assess. She wore pretty dark clothing and baggy clothing. So the most notable thing was that she had um, pretty, uh, quite a bit of bi bilateral knee hyperextension. In gait, she also had that same knee hyperextension and she had a longer stride length with kind of prolonged uh, hip extension and bilateral hip drop. Moving to sitting, uh, if we decrease the amount of hip flexion in sitting, that significantly decreased her symptoms. And she had weak and painful hip flexion, um, more so on that, that left hip, greater than the right. And in sitting, her lateral rotation range of motion was significantly greater than medial rotation. Uh, moving to some of the key tests um, in supine. So, I did uh, passive hip flexion with knee flexion and um, both passively and actively um, her, you could feel like the head of her femur was kind of coming anterior superior like into it, into my hand as we were doing that. She had pain um, after about 90 degrees of hip flexion. And then if I like laterally rotated her, um, her, her range increased um, and then also applying like a manual posterior glide significantly decreased her symptoms um, into hip flexion. And then also in supine doing straight leg raise. Um, so I would passively lifted her up and then asked her to kind of grab hold. And again, felt the same thing with the head of the femur kind of coming anterior into my hand. And then if I applied like a posterior glide um, to the head of the femur on that, that left side that decreased her symptoms with that, um, that test. Also in supine, her lateral rotation range of motion was significantly greater than her medial rotation. Moving to prone, again, lateral rotation greater than medial rotation. So because I saw that in the three positions, sitting supine and prone, um, kind of suspecting maybe some re retroversion um, bilaterally for her. And then uh, doing prone hip extension with the knee extended, she definitely demonstrated um, early in like extra hamstring recruitment compared to glute recruitment. Moving to quadruped, um, 
she kind of had a faulty starting alignment, decreased hip flexion, um, excessive thoracic flexion. And as she uh, rocked back, the, the left hip, left pelvis was higher, um, kind of indicating that that femur isn't gliding posteriorly quite as well on that left side. If I had her kind of laterally rotate in quadruped and then rock back, that, um, that made it feel better. And then also giving like a manual posterior glide as she was rocking back also decreased um, her symptoms and kind of increased the, the range that she was able to go through. So kind of summarizing, um, like specifically like muscle recruitment or um, length, length impairments that I, I saw with her. Um, seems like her rectus femoris, TFLITB, is overly active compared to iliopsoas. So that kind of is um, feeding into that imprecise hip flexion with those taking over because of those origins and insertions. And then also um, hamstring recruitment was greater than the glute recruitment. Again, kind of feeding into that um, lack of precision of movement during, during hip extension as well. Um, saw some long or weak uh, hip lateral rotators and then also uh, glute max. So my working movement system impairment diagnosis is femoral anterior glide syndrome. Uh, kind of the descriptor like paragraph about that syndrome there's excessive flexibility of the anterior hip structures um, as a result of, uh, you know, what they've been doing, whether like that's the extra uh, hip extension and standing or walking, or I think for her case, it might have been her um, competitive swimming, kind of forcing, uh, forcing a lot of excessive hip extension and maybe feeding into some of that laxity in the front. So the key principle of this movement system impairment is the imprecise spinning of, of the femoral head during hip flexion. And then ICF diagnosis, I said hip pain coordination deficit. So moving on to treatment after evaluation. So on the side here, I kind of put like four like main categories of the focus of treatment. And then I kind of go into each one of them. So the first is decreasing anterior stresses on the hip joint. So correcting her standing alignment and gait, kind of decreasing any knee hyperextension or hip ex like excessive hip extension, um, cueing to lift her heel up for, for shorter steps. And then we did icing for pain relief. That worked well for her. And then addressing her function. So with sitting, um, decreasing the amount of hip flexion, so like putting some pillows underneath of her when she was like on the couch, putting um, more like under her butt to decrease that hip flexion. That was pretty effective uh, initially to decrease her pain. And then also she did this weird thing where she was feeding her pets. I guess it takes like an hour for her to feed her, her pets, but she would do something. I'm forgetting exactly how it was, but essentially she was kind of just like really throwing her, her left hip, her involved hip into a lot of extension, kind of putting more pressure on that anterior hip. So we kind of problem solved and got her to do more of this like lunge um, or even like a little bit of a squat rather than this like really excessive hip extension on the, on the left side. And she said, she, yeah, it took her like an hour. So <laughs> we focused on that because that's quite a bit of um, potentially extra stress there. Another focus of treatment, restoring her precision of motion for hip flexion. So quadruped rock back in that pain-free range with um, a posterior glide. Supine, passive hip and knee flexion, also sitting passive hip flexion, getting those, um, like that rectus femoris uh, TFL to kind of relax and get, get that femur a little more posteriorly seated. Um, and then joint mobilization, again, applying posterior glide um, in that rock back and then also in squatting. That was helpful for her. And uh, she found the caudal glide in nine degrees of flexion was pretty pain relieving as well. And then these were kind of, this is kind of a list of exercises to work to improve the performance of her posterior muscles, her posterior glute med, glute max, deep lateral rotators. Um, so we kind of did all of those. The prone ones um, we did over pillows so that she wasn't forcing that end range hip extension. And then um, towards the end, she was able to perform hip flexion without any, without any symptoms. So 
I progressed that to adding resistance um, with her own hand, or I gave her a TheraBand to, to perform resisted um, hip flexion to kind of strengthen the, the psoas. So she had about five visits over a span of six weeks. She had a like a $65 copay, so she wanted to come in more, but was like, we're kind of like, that's not realistic um, for the wallet. Uh, I just saw her yesterday. She said her left hip is feeling a lot better. She was able to like do things and not, uh, like she like forgot about her left hip. So that was progress. And her pain levels decreased by about half there. Uh, she's planning to kind of come to one more visit as long as things are still going well. So, yeah, she hasn't met her goal of returning to biking or boating because she said she hasn't really had time to do that. But <laughs> so her goals are kind of changing. But, yeah, that's that's it. That's my case presentation. Thank you, guys. <laughs>